thing. You're making some kind of. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Uh, we are we are live and or uh, taping to be live. So please, uh, if you do make your your voices heard on the Zoom, and I'm the worst one of it, uh, remember that we're trying to be uh, non non. Uh, we're trying to be friendly, fr kid friendly. Okay, I'm pretty bad at that, so I'll try to catch myself. Uh, so Travis, can I say something? Can oh, I say yes. something, Mark? Sure. Yeah, please. I'm yeah, trying to get Steve's attention. <laughs> Steve, everybody should be muted, but they're not. Can isn't there a way to mute people? Uh huh. Okay. Let's see how to do that. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, that was your announcement, Suzanne. Suzanne. Yes. Okay. Uh, Travis. Travis is a, a young young man that's uh, playing Santa Claus tonight. And no, I'm kidding. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Hey everyone, uh, happy holidays. I am calling in from a holiday party, the basement of a holiday party. So if you hear any cheering upstairs, it's because uh, there's a lot of different festivities happening. Um, but I am uh, here to uh, give kind of an update on uh, some actions we did have this week at the State House. Uh, Pat Morita was there. I see Pat is here. Um, we did have a, a, a protest at the State House this week. Uh, to fight the coal bailouts, which are leftover still uh, from HB6. I think I talked about those last month. Mm -hmm. um, for anyone who doesn't know, HB6 was a, a nuclear energy bailout bill. And in order to get the coal companies to also support it, uh, they tacked on some coal bailouts as well to uh, two uh, old, outdated, polluting coal plants, one of which is in Indiana and Ohio. Rate payers are on the hook for bailing them out to the tune of $230,000 a day. So we delivered stockings full of coal to all the state representatives and state senators uh, in order to, uh, to encourage them to vote yes on SB 117, as well as House Bill 351. Those are the two bills, bipartisan bills, uh, that are right now stuck in the energy committees and we will, I believe, have to continue pushing next year. So, uh, but the action went very well. The Democrat uh, leaders loved it. The Republican, half of the wrong leaders, the good Republican leaders and representatives all loved it. And then, you know, the Republicans who are very pro-coal hated it and they called the sergeant of arms. So I think that counts as a success. Beyond that, I'd like to promote a couple of movies. Um, every year, I kind of come on here. Um, I, Basically, four years ago, when I first started coming to these things, I was working on finishing a movie called Killer Raccoons 2, Dark Christmas in the Dark. That movie has since been finished. We've shown it at Studio 35 uh, over the years, every December, and uh, we are doing that again. If anyone here wants to join on uh, December 17th or December 22nd, that is Friday, December 17th or Wednesday, December 22nd, they are 11 p.m. shows. So these are shows are for the night owls. But we had a screening last year, and I believe, yes, Dark Christmas in the Dark. It is, it is a redundant title meant to be redundant because we love redundancy and we love redundancy. Um, so Killer Raccoons 2, Dark Christmas in the Dark. You got to have a little fun in, these activism, in the activism game, and that's where Killer Raccoons 2 comes in. Um, so if you can join us at Studio 35 on December 17th or 22nd at 11 p.m., please do. Otherwise, uh, the movie is scream, uh, screen, streaming everywhere. Um, and uh, you can literally just type in Killer Raccoons 2. I guarantee it's the first thing that'll pop up if you want to watch it on the Amazon or Vudu or uh, PlayStation. It's literally everywhere. So I can share a link here after I uh, mute myself again. Beyond that, we do have a, another documentary. It's a little more serious called How America Killed My Mother. It's about my comedian friend whose mother passed away on Unfortunately, because of diabetes, which obviously, as we all know, happens to millions of Americans every year in this country, passing away uh, too soon uh, due to a preventable, uh, a preventable death um, uh, through diabetes. She basically died because she couldn't afford insulin anymore. So that one is slightly more serious. We do have some laughs in there because it's a comedian uh, coping with grief. But HowAmericaKilledMyMother.com is where you can watch that movie. That's just 40 minutes, and that is uh, only available online. We don't have any uh, screenings coming up of that. So 
just wanted to promote those. Just remind everyone, you're all doing great work. Uh, 2021, you know, we've kind of emerged from the darkness. I hope to see everyone in person again soon in 2022. And uh, beyond that, I'm happy to take any questions uh, off the air. I've added, that's not how it works. You got to ask the questions on the air and then I got to answer them on the air. Um, but I'm going to share some links here in the chat. And if anyone has anything else to ask me, uh, feel free. Thank you so much. Thanks, Travis. And anybody that uh, has signed up for this Zoom or Free Pass uh, will be posting out um, the results of the salon, and it'll be a video of what we're doing here. So thanks, thanks again, Travis. And 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 uh, yeah, I don't think it's America. I think it's capitalism. But okay, um, killed everybody. It's trying to kill everyone. So Kathy. Uh, I know you have an announcement, Kathy Callen Becker. Um, do you have time now? Are you ready now to do your thing? Yeah, and I can. And then now, Zach, can. you'll be up next, okay? Okay. Sure, um, I can talk now. Um, I, what I was going to talk about was the Columbus Climate Action Plan. Um, so it was released today at long last. Um, and there were a lot of us activists who really helped to make that plan a lot stronger than it started out. Um, so it was, the first draft was released, gosh, I think last November, 2020. And it called for, oh, so the IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as you may know, has said that the world has to cut carbon emissions basically in half, 45% by 2030, if we want a chance of a livable planet. So when the first draft of the Columbus Climate Action Plan came out, it called for an overall reduction of only 25%. And so I started looking in there and, and found just a lot of really weak goals. Um, so I went to work with a, a group of people. Um, Sunrise was very involved, um, Green Columbus, Columbus Stand Up and Simply Living, of course. Um, and we called for and got a city council hearing and we got about 30 people to testify at that city council hearing or submit written testimony. Um, I did a piece for Columbus Underground where I outlined here's a bunch of places where this plan, plan could do better. And each of the people who were testifying kind of took one area and testified about that. Um, so the city basically at that point took the climate action plan back to the drawing board. And in September of this year, they um, released the second draft and it was stronger. It called for a 36% reduction in carbon emissions, but you know, it's still not 45. And so we took another look at that and saw, okay, well, where they had, basically where they had a corporate partner or, or some kind of partnership, that plan got really strong. So um, for example, um, commercial renewable energy on commercial buildings went from 250 to 600 megawatts by 2030. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, and, and so, it, so that had gotten a lot stronger, but residential solar, which didn't have a commercial partner, did not, was not very strong. So still there were some, some areas had gotten a lot stronger, but some weaker. And so we said that to the city that, you know, we, we see that this is a pattern that, you know, where there, you have a corporate partner, these plans have gotten stronger, but where you don't, the city needs to not be afraid to step in. Um, oh, who is the corporate partner? Um, it's, there's no one specific cor corporate partner. They're just getting, I think they've just, it's probably through the Columbus partnership that they've had, um, corporations, like a lot of the corporations are going in on the 100% renewable energy aggregation. Um, so so we, we, as you know, the city passed 100% renewable energy aggregation. That, that does not by state law apply to any entity that uses more than 700,000 kilowatts per year, which is most large corporations or Ohio State. Um, but to their credit, some of the larger corporations said, we're going to start our own, you know, aggregation program where we're going to buy 100% renewable energy. Um, so that's, and then a lot of them are going to put enough solar panels on their buildings to um, in, increase, uh, you know, there's a really high goal for solar panels um, for, for commercial buildings, but not for, uh, there wasn't for residential. And then the same with like electric car fleets versus personal electric vehicles. And plus there were things like, um, public transportation. So you may know about the Link Us project that 
is planning out high speed bus rapid transit um, in eight routes of that across the city that had not been incorporated into the plan. So we brought this up to the city and said, you know, if the market is working, great, let it work. But if it's not working, you know, there are areas where the city is going to have to step in. So this third plan, which this third final um, draft of the plan, I guess it's the, it's the final, it is the Columbus Climate Action Plan now. Um, it is somewhat stronger in these areas. So um, for example, residential solar went from 10 megawatt goal to a 50 megawatt goal. And we were asking for like 100, but you know, 50 is certainly um, is, is stronger than that. Um, it did incorporate the Link Us initiative that I mentioned, the tree canopy goals got stronger. Um, but some other areas where they strengthened their goals were microgrids. So we had asked for, they had their first plan had three microgrids by 2030. We said, well, you can do one a year, you can do 10. Second plan, they had taken it out altogether. And we had been asking them to use the municipal utility to do community solar. So in the final plan, we have five microgrids and we have community solar. We have plans to add, you know, the municipal utility, the division of power. Um, we're gonna have to see what that looks like, but um, it's saying they're going to do community solar projects. So that's, that's very good. And one, um, a couple of other notable things, um, the city is building about a 50 megawatt solar farm on top of the old landfill. That's going to supply the division of power. And so the division of power is moving over to a lot more renewable energy. And then another um, notable thing is they have a goal now called Ambition 2050. So um, yeah, and I will get to questions as soon as I, I finish up through this. Um, let me put in the chat, um, there's an article that our coalition published on Columbus Underground. Um, and if, if you go to that, all of this uh, is kind of, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to this, like hundreds of moving parts. So um, you'll get kind of the pieces we pulled out, but this ambition 2050. So once they, they have a model for, you know, if we do take X action, how much will it lower the city's carbon emissions? It's through ICLEI, which is a widely accepted, widely used models by, and I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten what that acronym stands for. Um, but a lot of cities use it um, and they got to a 38% reduction. So that last 7% is in the ambition 2050. And the city is saying, we're gonna find 7% more and identify it by 2025. And we don't know what it is yet, but we're putting it in this plan because we wanna be held accountable for that last 7%, um, which is uh, definitely, um, <laughs> we're going to be watching and making sure and, and, and holding them accountable, but they've actually asked us. And during our process of discussion with the city, um, we've had a lot of back and forth. We did a sign on letter that many of you may have signed on after the second draft saying, hey, please, you know, increase the ambition of this plan to 45%. Um, but they have repeatedly attributed us pushing them as to how they got to this stronger ambition. But then even separate from the climate action plan, the city announced a whole string of equity goals, which have not gotten good press. Um, and, I, and I don't know why. Um, and, it, and we've been pushing them in general terms to do environmental equity, um, you know, help, uh, you know, help the low income communities of color that can least afford the effect and are most experiencing it through things like urban heat, heat island effect and flooding and things like that. So they um, have, they're going to have six new positions in Sustainable Columbus. Two of them are going to be about environmental justice. One of them is going to be an implementation coordinator to make sure what's in this plan that it actually gets done. Um, there's 1.5 million for a clean energy workforce program to target young adults in opportunity neighborhoods. There's another 1.5 million for weatherization and, and appliance replacements for small business and multifamily developments, i.e. apartments. And we've been telling them this whole time, pay attention to the split incentive, get these landlords to upgrade energy efficiency um, because a lot of times the landlords are the ones who have to pay for this and they don't have the incentive because the tenants are the ones paying the electricity bills. So they now have this big fund that's going to do this. I also forgot to mention they are, starting a green bank. Um, the city is um, putting 
seven million into a green bank. They have to call it a green fund for some sort of regulatory regions, but it's basically a green bank. Um, and then some of the larger corporations in town are going to put the other 20 million and that's going to help with um, nonprofit commercial and residential clean energy programs. Um, so it's a much stronger plan and this article I put in there outlines it. It would not have happened. The city has told us like many, many times that this would not have happened without us without staying push. engaged and pushing. Without push, without push. And yeah. that, that, that's ongoing with, with almost all the politics that are what we want. We have to keep pushing. We got to dream big and be big and and be bigger than we, we really are. I mean, we got to blow up like blowfish. Kathy, thank you for the update. I know there's a few questions. We'll get to those possibly if you can stay around a little bit, but I want to get to Nazek um, real quick here. Thank you. And yes, the work is going to continue and you guys have been doing great work. I've been, I've been helping just a little, little itty bitty bit. You know, our, our department's changing over to uh, uh, our fleet, to electric fleet uh, very soon and, and have about seven, eight, ten, ten cars right now. So um, it's it's sort of a fun time to see the city visioning. that They don't have the true gumptions. We're going to have to keep pushing. We're going to have to keep pushing. So thank you, Kathy. And, and uh, I know, Joe, you had some more questions. We'll, we'll get to more of that discussion of that. But read that article. It tells you mostly what, what you're asking. So Nazek uh, Hapasha, Hapasha is uh, from the, the League of Women Voters of Ohio. And I don't know if you know, but um, there's been a case uh, uh, filed at the Ohio Supreme Court on fair districting. And you know that's a big issue here in Ohio, uh, probably across the country and maybe even the world. You know, elections have been proved to be able to be maneuvered, maybe not stolen, but maneuvered at least, if districts are not fair. And so the League of Women Voters, Ohio Environmental Council, ACLU, um, CARE Ohio, all have joined in, and probably some others have joined in this this case. And, and Nazak's here to help us up, update us a little bit on that and then other things that she'd like to speak about. So please, go ahead. Thanks so much for having me here, Mark. I'm, I'm really excited to join you guys. Um, I did not know of the Columbus Free Press before, so this is wonderful for me as well. And thank you for having me here this evening. So I'm not sure if you guys have talked about redistricting in this forum before, but um, I will just very briefly go over like a, a timeline and make some things clear in case this is not familiar to anybody. Um, every 10 years, uh, district maps, well map, district maps on the local state and uh, congressional levels are basically reworked depending on the population. Um, in the uh, year 2020 and every decade uh, before that, obviously there is a census once the census numbers come out in the year after that, uh, the district maps are reworked based on the census. And so um, in Ohio, in 2015 and 2018, there was uh, two amendments that were approved with more than 75% of the vote by Ohioans to make sure that the map making process was a fair one and would result in maps that were not gerrymandered for Ohioans. So that means that our congressional districts and our state districts would represent, would uh, the elections would uh, end up representing Ohioans on a, on a true basis. So what exactly does that mean? It means that uh, in statewide and federal elections, approximately 60% of the vote or actually 55% of the vote or less goes to the Republican Party and uh, about 45% goes to the Democratic Party. Um, however, in the very gerrymandered state maps that we have in the congressional districts that we have, we have super majority um, in the Ohio legislature right now, which ends up really having giving us just a very dysfunctional government. Uh, on the congressional level, that means that predictably, 75% of our vote in the House has always gone Republican, even though 
uh, Ohioans only vote Republican, about 55% of the vote goes to the Republican Party. So again, these um, amendments were meant to make sure that uh, Ohioans are fairly represented, whether you're a uh, Republican or Democrat. It's not meant to get um, either political party an advantage. It's it's meant to the it's meant for representational fairness. So. Um, the timeline was supposed to begin in the early summer where the Ohio Redistricting Commission was supposed to have hearings. They were very late in having hearings with the uh, excuse that the census data was uh, delayed, but really it was just the beginning of many excuses to go over timelines and to pass deadlines. Um, and it was the beginning of, of really a, a very, um, unfair process on their part, which resulted in unfair maps in the end. Uh, the original deadline for the Ohio House and Ohio Senate Legislative District maps was September 1st, and that is supposed to be drawn by the seven member Ohio Redistricting Commission. They went over their timeline, but they ended up um, approving four year maps uh, past, past that deadline sometime in the middle of September. And the reason that they are four-year maps and not 10-year maps is because they were completely, um, the, the vote was 5-2 and the two Democrats on the Ohio Redistricting Commission voted against them. It would have required that the, the two Democrats on the, in, in order for a 10 year map to have passed, it must have had two Democrats and at least two Republicans vote in favor of the map. So a 5-2 vote with all of the Ohio Republicans voting um, yes, and both of the Democrats voting no resulted in a four year map. That is the first lawsuit that we brought against the state of Ohio for gerrymandered maps. That lawsuit was actually just heard in the Ohio Supreme Court this past week on Wednesday. So um, Mark mentioned that there was other people that were party to the lawsuit. I don't know too much about the other lawsuits, but I just wanna clarify that there was actually three lawsuits that were filed. Um, we worked with uh, ACLU of Ohio and APRI, and there was uh, several individual named plaintiffs in our suit. Um, I can't speak too much to the other suits, but I know that Ohio Organizing Collaborative and Care Ohio also pressed um, charges against uh, the state or filed a, a lawsuit against the map. Um, but those technically speaking are separate lawsuits that were filed, totaling in three lawsuits and all arguments were heard against the state um, this past Wednesday. So we now um, await we now await the, the court's decision. And um, we also await the court's decision to figure out what will happen next, because based on what they say, and based on the guidance that they give, this can go back to the Ohio Redistricting Commission. They could rule that the Ohio District Redistricting Commission needs to take a stab at a second map, and they would need to provide clarification on um, what exactly they, they need to do right. Um, or they could, or it could go up to the um, United States Supreme Court. Uh, it's it's really anybody's guess what will happen the last time gerrymandering a uh, lawsuit, <coughs> excuse me, was at the Ohio Supreme Court. They actually kicked it back to the states uh, and we, we won um, on the federal level and they, you know, it got, it went up to the Supreme Court and they kicked it back. So we're, we're waiting to see from the Ohio Supreme Court what happens. Um, I'm not sure if anybody knows the makeup of the Supreme Court, but it is, um, it is primarily a Republican for three, but there is um, Maureen O'Connor, who is the Supreme Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court court who was thought to be a swing vote. Uh, and she did ask many, um, I would say, uh, introspective questions during the case uh, to, to make us think that, you know, this, this might go our way. We might have things come back um, to the Ohio Redistricting Commission, and they might be ordered to make new state maps. Uh, the other thing that happened is that the um, congressional map making process uh, went back and forth between the legislature. It started in the legislature. It went to the Ohio Redistricting Commission. Then it went back to the legislature. Uh, in the end, again, we ended up with four-year maps because um, we did not get 
uh, it required at least a third of Ohio Democrats to vote in favor of the maps that did not happen. And that's why we ended up with technically a four year map. Um, so that lawsuit was filed after the, uh, the legislature uh, voted on the map. Uh, we don't yet have a date for when that will be heard, but it will also be heard in the Ohio Supreme Court. Uh, so that's that's kind of where we are on maps. Before I talk about um, some other voting issues, uh, I'll, I'll see if anybody has questions. I don't guarantee that I'll be able to, to answer them, but I'll do my best. My Go ahead with other issues. We'll we'll get to the questions in the chat, please. It, chats, and then if there's something that's not really able to be handled in the chat, we'll get with you later about that. But well, yeah, we'll let a few questions go. But so this four-year map and and uh, will take us through the next presidential election and then two congressional elections. Just that so is, everybody knows. That yeah. is correct. Um, so, so go ahead for some other voting issues, please. My my policy area is actually in voting and elections, um, and I'll just talk about kind of like you know the things that we're looking ahead to in 2022. Obviously, 2022 is a big general election year. The governor and many statewide positions will be on the ballot, um, and so for just for purposes of um, our regular programming, that's gonna be a busy year for us. But on the advocacy side, uh, we're also looking at two very comprehensive bills that are in the legislature right now. Uh, two election bills, they are House Bill 294 and House Bill 387. Um, these bills are actually, um, House Bill 294 particularly has been kind of controversial in Ohio. Democrats have dubbed this bill, uh, who was sponsored by two Republicans, uh, Seitz and Ray, an attack on democracy. And many progressive organizations have followed suit, but the League maintains a neutral stance on House Bill 294. Uh, the reason is because we believe that there are good provisions in this bill and bad provisions in this bill, and we have called for the removal of what we see to be the bad provisions in this bill, which are the, that it restricts the use of ballot drop boxes and it shortens the time to return and mail in ballot. Nonetheless, we do believe that House Bill 94 is an imperfect solution to a big problem in Ohio, which um, if any of you are familiar with the supplemental process, also known as the voter purge. Every year, Ohio has a process of basically kicking people off of the voter rolls. And they, they do this to what they say, clean up the, clean up the voter rolls. But um, we proved in 2019, actually, that thousands of people get kicked off these rolls that are not supposed to be. Because the, prof the, the process is outdated and it is, there are, there are far better ways to maintain clean voter rolls in Ohio than to do this. And one of them is through automated voter registration, which is a major aspect of House Bill 294. We believe that it would make great strides in eliminating wrongful purges of uh, voters in Ohio and thus increase voter registration rates and voter turnout rates, especially among historically disenfranchised groups and young voters who are the, at the um, biggest likelihood of being wrongfully purged from the voter rolls. Other voter provisions include um, that an elector would be able to provide an electronic utility bill as a form of voter ID. It would also codify election administration plans. I know that's kind of a, a bit of a, you know, heavy lingo there, but uh, something that the league has been fighting for for a long time and is really important to the running of safe and good elections. Um, so th this other bill I'll talk about really quickly is, is an awful bill. Some of you might have heard about some of the, the really bad things going on in some other states like Texas and what that have had really, really um, stringent uh, voter and elections laws passed, 387 is that and much more. It would set back Ohio's early voting system decades. It would eliminate ba ballot drop boxes completely. It would shorten the early voting period to just six days. And we now have 28 or 29 days. It would require a valid excuse to cast an, to cast an absentee ballot. We now have no excuse 
um, absentee ballot. You can you can request and send in a mail-in ballot uh, just because you want to do that. You don't need to have a valid excuse to do so. It would ban the mailing of absentee ballot applications to all Ohio voters. So I don't know if this is something you've noticed before, but the Secretary of State automatically mails all registered voters an application for a mail-in ballot. Uh, whether you need one or not, the, um, that, that would be banned. He would no longer do that. Uh, furthermore, it requires a registered voter uh, to provide a photo ID to, to vote in any situation, whether it be um, early voting, mail-in voting, if you have a valid excuse or in-person voting, you would need a photo ID and you would need a photo ID just to register to vote. So it really, again, sets back, um, sets back the, the progress that we've made in Ohio tremendously on um, just expanding the ballot to, to Ohioans. Uh, that's, that's all I have for you guys tonight. Thank, thank you, Nozick. Thank you very much. And that update and the league, the work, the work of the league, uh, we can't even, uh, thank you, thank you. Keep it going, keep it going. Um, yeah, I know there's going to be a lot of court reality, so um, yeah. try try to stay on the street as well as not just the court. So, <laughs> um, uh, David Swanson's on, and he he's going to join us pretty soon, uh, um, and he actually is here right now. Um, the concern I, I, this past week, I've been listening to some crazy stuff about elections and uh, the ability of what legislatures may be able to do um, if secretary of states do something that the legislatures don't want to do and 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 that's a that that can play out very ugly as what some people are saying so we got to stay attuned to this election thing um we really do i know it's a in a lot of our own hearts where we believe it's it's a game that's you know it's something that we're not we're not too vested in some of us because it's 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 a game that's stacked against us no matter what I mean you got to play a million billionaire uh, game to really be but the league is really showing us that we can take it to them and really and 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 make make some changes hopefully down the road um, so thank you again uh, thank you. David David Swanson some of you are on from California just because you're with us tonight so David you have been a great recruiter thank you um, you are starting to become our an annual uh, speaker around the end of the year and uh, I hope you see that as as a possibility for the come up the years uh, Suzanne really is interested in that of you being more of a, of a, a regular around December uh, to give sort of a reflection on peacemaking, you know, where it's been and where it's going and um, the challenges that uh, building a movement will be. And congratulations to the uh, uh, World uh, Beyond War, uh, 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 received a, a great uh, Peacemaker Award internationally recognized for their work. And it's right there, right over his shoulder. I know he's going to keep it close. It's sort of like a Grammy of the Peacemakers. So there you go. Um, so David, if you can go forward, but I just, uh, Morgan Harper was going to be on. I don't know if she's on. She's a candidate for the U.S. Senate. Uh, she wanted to come on and say hello to us for a second. If she, her meeting's running over a little bit, so we may just have her on a little bit later if she can come on. But yeah, why don't we just go ahead? Uh, I'm not hearing anything. So yeah, so David, why don't you go ahead and do, do your annual uh, beautiful thing. I did want to maybe share something real quick here uh just because you know I, I don't know if you know but we've over the years have been very much uh paying attention to this thing and i don't know if you know what happened yesterday but it was the universal declaration of human rights day and this preamble is very important and uh, just bring you to uh, some of the words. We can read it as you want to. But peace is something that's uh, It's a guaranteed right. We need to we we need to be about working for that. But peace is not an attainment. It's the way we go to it. There's other things. Uh, but this, as you know, was uh, is an international document. 
I'm not going to take much time for you to look at it, but this is just the preamble. And so what it says is, therefore, the Declaration of Human Rights as a common standard of achievement for peoples and all nations to end the, the, every individual and every organ of society keeping this declaration constantly in mind shall strive for t by teaching and education to promote respect for these rights and freedoms and by the progressive measures, national and international, to secure their universal and effective recognition and observance, both among the members, states themselves, and among the peoples of the territories under their jurisdiction. So I just wanted you to s sort of know and recognize that that's um, this week happened. And uh, with that, David, please go forward and, and cover what you'd like to. I, um, Tim, Tim Chavez has uh, uh, requested that you do a 53-minute radio version. No, yeah, I mean, you can do it as long as you want to. But I'm just, Thank all right. you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> all right, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you for making it an annual invitation. That's great. Um, and I was told 10 or 15 minutes and, and then uh, further conversations, so I will try that. But feel free to interrupt me uh, and otherwise to ask me to explain myself uh, after I run through uh, a few prepared remarks, um, which I uh, titled, the, the title that I sent uh, to Suzanne was, uh, what would have been better in a democracy summit and why there should be no, there should not be any more Pearl Harbor days. Um, and the, the glory of Pearl Harbor Day uh, on the 7th of this month, I think still lingered yesterday on Human Rights Day with a democracy summit wrapping up with Nobel so-called Peace Prize laureates talking about US government approved and funded journalism, with the US media still dominated by Donald Trump and how he's out of power at the moment, all is going just swimmingly in the steady march of freedom and goodness. If you pay no attention to the little man behind the curtain, or maybe it's a small army of little men behind a thousand curtains, we can discuss the many causes and motivations of deception and self-deception. Suffice it to say that once you look, listen, or smell for an instant at the actual state of the world, you can't turn away and you can't stomach the pretty picture. The U.S. government is trying to imprison or kill Julian Assange for the crime of journalism, arm Saudi Arabia for the crime of genocide, and overthrow the government of Venezuela for the crime of representing Venezuelans. Residents of Pearl Harbor have jet fuel in their drinking water, which is downright healthy in comparison with the myths spread around about Pearl Harbor's history. Climate collapse weather is ripping through U.S. towns and sweatshops on the mainland. And various powerful U.S. figures are being let off the hook as their supplier of underage sex is being prosecuted. The exclusion of certain countries from the democracy summit was not a side issue. It was the very purpose of the democracy summit. And excluded countries were not excluded for failing to meet standards of behavior of those that were invited or doing the inviting. Uh, invitees didn't even have to be representatives of countries. Even a US-backed failed coup leader from Venezuela was invited, as were representatives of Israel and Iraq and Pakistan and Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola and Malaysia and Kenya, and uh, centrally and importantly, uh, representatives of Taiwan and Ukraine, who are, I think, pawns in this game, the game of weapons sales being run by the world's dominant 80% of the market international weapons dealer. Look at the US State Department website on the Democracy Summit right at the top. Democracy doesn't happen by accident. We have to defend it, fight for it, strengthen it, renew it. President Joseph R. Biden Jr. Not only do you have to defend it and fight for it, but you have to do so against certain threats and get a big gang in on the fighting to quote, tackle the greatest threats faced by democracies today through collective action. The representatives of democracy at this amazing summit are such experts on democracy that they can quote, defend democracy and human rights at home and abroad. 
It's the abroad part that may make you scratch your head if you're thinking of democracy as having anything to do with, you know, democracy. How do you do it for somebody else's country? But if you keep reading, the Russiagate themes begin to explain things. Quote, authoritarian leaders are reaching across borders to undermine democracies from targeting journalists and human rights defenders to meddling in elections, end quote. You see, the problem is not that the United States has long been in reality an oligarchy. The problem is not the US status as top holdout on basic human rights treaties the treaties that put into law the ideas of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the U.S. being the top opponent of international law or the U.S. being the top abuser of the veto at the United Nations or the top incarcerator in the world or the top environmental destroyer by various measures or the top weapons dealer, or top funder of dictatorships, top war launcher or top coup sponsor. The problem is not that rather than democratizing the United Nations, the US government is attempting to create a new forum in which it is uniquely and even more than before, more equal than others. The problem is certainly not the rigged primary election that Russiagate was concocted to distract from. And in no way whatsoever is the problem the 85 foreign elections counting just those that we know of and can list that the US government has interfered in. The problem is Russia and nothing sells weapons like Russia, although China is moving on up there. The oddest thing about the democracy summit is that there was not a democracy anywhere in sight. I mean, not even the pretense of it. The US public votes on nothing, not even on whether to hold democracy summits. Back in the 1930s, the Ludlow Amendment almost gave us the right to vote on whether any war could be started, but the State Department shut that down and it's never come back. The U.S. government is not just a system of elected representation rather than a democracy and a highly corrupted one that fundamentally fails to represent us. It's also driven by an anti-democratic culture in which politicians routinely brag to the public about ignoring public opinion polls and are applauded for it. When sheriffs or judges misbehave, the main criticism, the overwhelming criticism is usually that they were elected. A more popular reform than clean money or than fair media is the anti-democratic imposition of term limits. Politics, the word politics is such a dirty word in the United States that I got an email last week from an activist group accusing one of the two big US political parties of quote, politicizing elections. It turned out that they had in mind various voter suppression behavior, all too common in the world's beacon of democracy, where the winner of every election is none of the above and the most popular party is neither. Not only was there no national democracy at the, the democracy summit, there was also nothing democratic happening at the democracy summit. This hand-picked gang of officials did not vote or achieve consensus on anything. The participation in governments that, that you could find even at an Occupy movement event in your town was nowhere to be seen. And neither were there any corporate journalists shrieking at them what is your one single demand? What is your one single demand? In fact, they had several completely vague and hypocritical demands on their websites, uh, produced, of course, without the threat of democracy being employed or a single tyrant being harmed in the process. So I think better than a democracy summit would have been establishing the right to vote in the United States, publicly funding election campaigns, ending gerrymandering, as we were hearing about a few moments ago, and which uh, somehow, I'm sure purely by accident, gerrymandered Dennis Kucinich right out of a district, uh, ending the filibuster, ending the Senate, publicly counting paper ballots at polling places, creating the means for citizen initiatives to set public policy, criminalizing bribery, forbidding the profiting by public officials from their public actions, ending the sale or gift of weapons to foreign governments, shutting foreign military bases, quintupling actual foreign aid and prioritizing support for law-abiding governments, ceasing to be the leading holdout 
on all of those human rights treaties and disarmament treaties, joining the International Criminal Court, abolishing the veto at the UN Security Council, abolishing the UN Security Council in favor of the General Assembly, complying with the treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, joining the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, ending lawless, immoral, and deadly sanctions on a few dozen countries, investing in a program of conversion to peaceful and green energies and enterprises, prohibiting the consumption of fossil fuel, prohibiting deforestation, prohibiting the keeping of or slaughter of livestock, prohibiting the killing of human prisoners, prohibiting mass incarceration. And well, one could go on all night when the simple answer is that anything, even a warm bucket of spit would have been better than a democracy summit. And let's hope it's the last one. And let's dare to hope that this past Pearl Harbor Day is the last one as well. The US government, of course, in reality, contrary to the myths we're all taught, planned, prepared for, and provoked a war with Japan for many years and was in many ways at war already waiting for Japan to fire the first shots when Japan attacked the Philippines and Pearl Harbor and a dozen other places. What gets lost in the questions about exactly who knew what, when, in the days before those attacks and what combination of incompetence and cynicism allowed them to is the fact that major steps had indisputably been taken toward war, but none had been taken toward peace. The Asia pivot of the Obama, Trump, and Biden era has a precedent in the years leading up to World War II, as the United States and Japan built up their military presences in the Pacific. The United States was aiding China in the war against Japan and blockading Japan to deprive it of critical resources prior to Japan's attack on US troops and imperial territories. The militarism of the United States does not free Japan of any responsibility for its militarism or vice versa. But the myth of the innocent bystander shockingly assaulted out of the blue is no more real than the myth of the war to save the Jews. The US war plans and warnings of the Japanese attack were published in US and Hawaiian newspapers prior to the attack. And now you can't get newspapers to admit as much. As of December 6th, 1941, no poll had found majority US public support for entering a war, but the president of the United States had instituted a draft, activated the National Guard, created a huge Navy in two oceans, traded old destroyers to England for the lease of its bases in the Caribbean and Bermuda, supplied planes and trainers and pilots to China, imposed harsh sanctions on Japan, advised the US military that a war with Japan was beginning, and secretly ordered the creation of a list of every Japanese and Japanese American person in the United States. So it matters that people make the giant leap from all wars but one in history have been horrible, evil catastrophes, Two, all wars in history have been horrible, evil catastrophes. And rejecting the outrageous Pearl Harbor propaganda is needed for that to happen. Um, I, I, I just want to mention one thing that occurred to me while I was uh, watching the beginning of this call, and that is uh, I, I do work at World Beyond War, also at a place called Roots Action, uh, where we we work with a lot of candidates and we're constantly hearing from congressional candidates uh, and asking them, why do you have no foreign policy? Why do you have no views whatsoever on you know 60% of the money you want to oversee? Uh, and a lot of times, honestly or not, they tell us, I don't know anything about foreign policy. So we, so I've drafted a 15, 20 page primer on foreign policy for US congressional candidates that one of these days soon, hopefully within the next few days, we're gonna make public and send around to everyone we can and say, give this to congressional candidates and to people you think should be congressional candidates. So they at least can't say, I don't know anything. <laughs> you know, They can say I'm bought and owned by the weapons dealers, but they can't say, I don't know anything. So anyway, hopefully that will be useful to a few people. Um, thank you again for letting me David, be here. David, thank you. And uh, I'll let uh, Morgan, Morgan Harper is running for US Senate from Ohio. 
Nice. She, she was she was on and she's jumping in. She may jump on, but I, if she's available, I'd like her to speak a little bit. I don't know if she's talk on now or not. Um. Okay, so she she jumped off. So David, um, who? That's a long list of you you diatribe very strongly. No, I'm kidding. That it was a, it was the 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 documentation is clear. The the present agenda of the United States hegemony is is on a wrong track. It's it's killing the world, the globe. It's uh, it's increasing inequalities across all sectors. What what up, down, left, right, however you want to say it. It's all over the place. Um, you're, you have long time maintained many, many progressive, and I've, I've been in many conversations with you. Where, where's your hope? Where, where are we heading 2022 um, as a movement? What was it? I know you're, you're doing great work um, in that, that north central area of the United States. You know, the Southern work needs to be done and it's being done by different folks. For me, I've always thought, not always just national, yes, national has to happen, but nationwide behavior and how we build movement to, to, to address some of the things that you're, you, you have delineated. I mean, Jeff Wilson, uh, Wilson Smith, Wilson ah, is a professor from the University of Hawaii. I was at, a, an event in Japan a, a year right after 9-11 um, happened. Very traditional, bad, 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 bad time. Um, but there was talking about the, 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 the geopolitical message of, of um, colonialization and, and civilization the world world was war uh, civiliza against civilization you know those those kind of discussions were going on at that time but he said that uh, Pearl Harbor is going to be or 9-11 at that point but was going to be like Pearl Harbor which was a a photogenic historic photogenic for a, a generation multi-generations uh, uh, of how they behave, where where they expect things to be. So there's a limitation on what can happen because of mythology, you know, white white mythology, the frontierism, settler, all that stuff. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm talking, but do you hear what I'm talking about? Going towards um, and then other folks. If you have questions, please put them in chat. Thumbs up, whatever, and uh, Stephen and I'll help get 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 you into this discussion. Uh, well, million and one topics there, uh, Mark, each of which I could talk about for an hour. So I'll just try a few minutes and you can cut me off. Um, I, I have absolutely no hope or interest in hope. And uh, for anyone on the on the hopium kick, I, uh, I recommend getting off it and finding uh, enjoyment and solidarity and fulfillment in the work, uh, the work of trying to lessen the damage, of trying to mitigate the catastrophes, of trying to push uh, a vision for a better world as far as we can get it, even if it's nowhere, uh, because it's very enjoyable and it's it's a hell of a lot more enjoyable than sitting around uh, griping or uh, watching football or anything else uh, you can do with any uh, time you have uh, available. Um, I, I think, uh, and not just I think, but the scientists who make the doomsday and various other experts think nuclear apocalypse is closer than it's ever been. Um, I have, if you think I'm doom and gloom, wait till you hear my radio show this coming week that I've recorded with, with Helen Caldicott, uh, who started a bunch of anti-nuclear groups decades ago. Uh, it's, it's one steady rant of uh, the death that is coming at the hands of the U.S. military for the, you know, every living thing on the planet. Uh, and I think Think, and not just I think, but gazillions of scientists think uh, that climate apocalypse, uh, unbeknownst to most uh, scientists in the world, greatly uh, exacerbated by militaries, uh, is, is also far more likely and underway than uh, it's ever been. Um, and 
And, and I think the the possibility of any reasonable sort of uh, response or mitigation coming out of national governments uh, has been, you know, pretty well stomped in the face and buried. Uh, and uh, if you if you have any notion of you know uh, of the U.S. government responding remotely adequately to anything, I would I would point to something called COVID. Um, but I, I I think in addition to the the whole planet you know, going down the tubes, uh, I think it's worth being aware that the U.S. political system, uh, you know, has got two parties controlling it, one of which is going full out fascist and the other of which is collapsing on itself without placement. So that is not a real happy uh, situation either, unless we can turn it around. And that's what we got to work on. Uh, but there's God, there's thousands and thousands of people turning things around and winning successes and New York City divesting from nukes yesterday and shepherds in the mountains in Montenegro stopping a new NATO base with their bodies and everybody celebrating the treaty on the prohibition of nukes one year anniversary coming up January 22nd. And a handful of environmental groups beginning to wake up to the possibility that they have to say something about militarism, including uh, with the, the, you know, the Navy poisoning everybody's uh, drinking water around Pearl Harbor and potentially Honolulu uh, with jet fuel, because even the most holy propaganda sites just don't motivate giving the slightest damn about actual people, even in the military, even at that site. Um, so did you go to Glasgow? I know you were thinking about it, but did you get to go over to Glasgow? Uh, I did because I know that was a big, I know that was a big agenda was trying to merge the two, you know, that the global military is the, one of the biggest, uh, global, uh, destroyers as well. Um, world beyond else? war went there. I did not personally go there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, anybody have uh, other input? I mean, others. It's been great seeing everybody throwing things into this chat. There's going to be a great resource, a lot of, a lot of resource coming in. Mark, so, I was going yes, to please. say that uh, Talk Nation Radio, which is David's uh, David Swanson's yeah. radio show, plays on WGRN 94.1 Tuesdays yeah. at 7.30 in the morning. Yeah. So you can hear David, you got a new show every week, right? Right, yeah. A new show every week, half an hour show. So people might want to tune in for, to that. It streams live on WGRN.org as well. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. the WGRN, WCRS, those are our, our resource babies. We need to make sure we take care of them and, and know the good programming that's coming across uh, the airwaves. Oh, so, yeah, we might... We might not be mighty, but we're going to be strong, you know. <laughs> uh, anybody me. else? On that, Mark? Yeah, sure, Stephen. I think we're doing pretty good on that side, Mark. Uh, David, your show is really enjoyed, uh, WGRN. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, we uh, really like programming it. It's great to hear it, and uh, it's great that you're a guest today. But, you know, one of our biggest issues right now is the voter suppression. I mean, that seems to be, um, you know, uh, I don't know how many states now, probably over 30 that have, uh, as soon as the election was over, uh, is that uh, all these bills came out through, you know, I think they're ALEC uh, templates that basically are hitting all the state senates, because that's been a strategy for a long time among the Republican Party is get, get control of the state houses. So uh, what do you say we should do as far as fighting that? Um, I'm, Everybody says come out and force, but um, you know how do we motivate people to be able to uh, really see that there's there is a better agenda with Biden, but you know of course when you look at the budget that was just recently passed uh, and he's going to sign it uh, for the military, you know I think we're what thirty billion dollars over what was requested. You know this is really uh, pathetic, and uh, it's, it's it's very hard to fight. So. I was, uh, how, how do you think we should deal with this? Because it really comes down to voters. I mean, we got to get these people out of those offices and get some new blood in there. Like Morgan Harper would be a great move. And others. I, 
I think, uh, I, I mean, the problem is always a few layers uh, worse than what we hear, right? I mean, the, the military budget of last year was catastrophically, horrendously, gargantuanly uh, unacceptable, immoral, murderous, uh, guaranteed to kill vastly more people by that diversion of resources than with any of the weapons that would be bought and used. Uh, and the, the, the sort of the following the line of the progressives in Congress, who God knows are better than anybody else in Congress, uh, and complaining, uh, you know, that committees and Republicans and the Senate added money on top of what Biden requested and legitimizing as the leading progressives in the House of so-called representatives had done. That I'm standing by what Biden asked for. So it just erases from everybody's understanding that Biden took that horrendous amount from last year and asked for significantly more. And then Congress added significantly more on top of that. And then the Senate added significantly more on top of that. Uh, and so, you know, we have to we have to be independent outside the Congress observers and agitators uh, and point out all of these atrocities, not just the ones that the that the House Democrats want uh, objected to. Um, and if you look at the fact that this same bill is uh, whether anybody's heard about it or not, creating a draft registration for women so that if you're an 18 year old and a female, uh, you now have the privilege and the great feminist progressive step of being required to put your name down to potentially be forced against your will to go kill and die for, for war profits. And almost every state in the country does that automatically. They know anything about you, they automatically put your information into draft registration. But the majority of states in the country claim they can't do that for voter registration because it's just that, oh, it's, it's, it's kind of complicated. The technology is not really, you know. So this is what the priorities are, right? And so if we want to prioritize voter registration, uh, you know, we have to go and tell them that we know what's what and they're hypocritical and they need to fix this. And there are states making voter registration automatic and every state needs to do that. Uh, but unless we combine it, and maybe this call is helping do that with the other speaker I've heard about, but unless we combine it with giving people anybody worth voting for, Man. It's it's going to be limited, you know, and you're not going to vote yourself people worth voting for. Yeah. You're going to reform the system with mass popular movements of nonviolent action outside of elections. So we need to come at this in a number of ways. Great. Morgan is back on. So, Morgan, you, did you want to uh, 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 bring us your wisdom? I mean, you, you're, you've been out on the road here a long time, flat tires and all. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, no, I mean, I think a lot of what we're hearing and a lot of the, the pitch I'm making about our campaign for United for this open United States Senate seat here in Ohio is a lot of what you know David was just saying that we are not going to win this seat by doing the same old thing. And you know, some folks are waking up to that even in more traditional democratic circles after the results in Virginia and New Jersey. But I think we in Ohio have known it for some time. Joe Biden didn't even win here after a term of Trump. So, you know, the biggest boogeyman of all didn't give us the numbers and the turnout that, you know, we, we needed to win. And so I think what I, I especially agree with the fact that a lot of people are no longer going to just vote because they think or they're told it's the right thing to do. I meet a lot of people who are saying, I am only voting if I believe in the candidate. I believe that they're actually going to be real and that I, I think it's worthy of my time. So, you know, it's interesting. That is the whole point of why I decided to get into this Senate race is that we continue to be in many ways in some, you know, in a democratic crisis and also just a crisis at our community level, which I think a lot of us, and I know a lot of us on, on the call are involved in, in the climate and housing and healthcare. And we can't just continue to live like this. And we're seeing the impacts of that. So we have been traveling around the state 
And we've been in a lot of places. And I, I would say on the positive side that the message of we can't continue to do the same old thing is actually resonating uh, among a lot of different types of people. And, and who do we need to vote in this election to have a shot of, of flipping, you know, as the conventional term is of flipping the seat blue. But as I think a lot of us know, not just flipping it to be blue, but having blue actually stand for something and stand for real change. We have to make sure that we have a lot of young people that are energized and excited. And, you know, the conventional political wisdom is that young people don't turn out to vote and so consistently. And so that isn't worth targeting. And we reject that. We have to give young people something worth voting for to get them to vote. And we have to have a lot of deep engagement there. We need to have a lot of Black people voting. I mean, for folks who saw our launch video, we're not hiding the ball here. That is a pretty key part of this. And we need to make sure we have you know, a campaign that is not just considering that as an afterthought, but really putting it at the forefront of the organizing that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And you know, another key constituency in these constituencies to be at the exclusion of any other group of people. But, you know, when you look at the data, you look at the numbers, who do we, who do we need to really run up the numbers amongst to have a shot of, of getting the right turnout, you know, women, independent women, another key part of that coalition, um, and being able to speak to what those issues are motivating that part of the electorate is pretty important. And I, and I'm finding, you know, especially with a lot of the developments around reproductive rights, that's one issue that people have felt like they're starting to understand the costs of settling or compromising or having, you know, uh, elected officials that maybe evolved on the issue of what basic rights should be and really want somebody that they can get behind. And especially a lot of younger women, women, I would say I'm hearing that from. So uh, we've been in it for a few months, uh, launched in August and we're now in December and the primaries in May and things are really going to start getting cooking here in, in January after the holidays when folks are hopefully going to be more plugged into the, the midterm elections, which are right around the corner. But, you know, I really do think that we have a huge opportunity here in the state of Ohio to make the case, the progressive case for why this is the direction that we must go in and have more grassroots campaign to have any shot of fending off the far right forces that are dominating in our state and increasingly in our country and look forward to hopefully working with all of you to make that happen and, and happy to answer any questions that anyone has. I, I have a question, Ms. Harper, if I could. Um, yes. I, I've just looked at your I just For looked sure. at your website. It's got a terrific issues page, all kinds of important issues and a paragraph or so of a good paragraph or so on so people know what they're voting for, right? But federal discretionary yeah. spending in every recent year has more than half of it has been one single item, militarism. And, and, mm -hmm. and as with many congressional campaign websites, there's no mention of war, peace, the budget, trade, diplomacy, treaties, international law, uh, co global cooperation on pandemics or on uh, climate. The, the 96% of humanity just doesn't exist, even though it's the majority of the money that, that the job is overseen. And so I'm, I've just, as I asked, I've asked millions of candidates this, what is the thinking behind foreign policy just not existing there? Yeah, well, and I appreciate the question. And I heard earlier in your, your remarks where you were talking about the paper that you've prepared to brief candidates. And I, and I would welcome getting that too. I mean, in my case, it isn't that I have no awareness of the issues, but I would say um, it, it just isn't something that comes up a lot when you're talking to a lot of voters, to be frank. And that's not necessarily, well, that's not necessarily a good thing, but the exception that I would say, and that I've seen, especially you know, running statewide versus I previously had run just in, in Columbus, is on issues around the supply chain and now in trade and how that's related to the incomes that people are feeling, the outcomes, I should say, that people are feeling on the ground around layoffs, the lack of manufacturing. So um, in that way, it does come up. I mean, I just, you know, one quick anecdote there. I was in Lima in Northwest, Northwestern Ohio, and and a guy came up to me after my, my remarks talking about the threats of corporate consolidation and unbridled corporate power in our country and how we need to do something about that. And he was like, you know, you're you really liked what you said, got me thinking. And one thing I've been wondering about, and this was before all the media coverage around supply chain and, and all of this is, you know, how is it possible that I'm not going to have a job because we decided to 
turn over the production of these semiconductor chips to a different part of the world. And now I might not be able to report to work because I'm going to get furloughed because we don't have the supply. We need to do our work. And I, he was like, does that, does that make any sense to you? And he's asking sincerely. And I'm like, no, this doesn't necessarily make any sense. There's absolutely something we can do about it, but we have to have better people in office that understand what's going on and are going to be able to implement the right policy. And so, you know, on those issues, I am finding that it comes up. I know that's not, you know, squarely in a foreign policy issue per se, but you know, that type of connection. And then honestly, why a lot of people don't like Democrats right now in the state of Ohio is that they are blaming Democrats for shipping jobs overseas and not really being on the side of working people in a lot of these trade agreements. And, you know, I, I, as I'm sure many, again, many people on the call are aware, there are people from both parties who have been part of getting us to this point economically and also an inflated military spending budget over the course of my lifetime at least, but, but right now in the state of Ohio, Democrats are the ones blamed for these problems and we have to rebrand in that way. So the beauty of a Senate campaign is that it's statewide. So you're not really tied down to the other issue that we were talking about today was the fair districting, which is a whole other issue that I'm sure mm -hmm. you're very deep in and you were very supportive of uh, re-examining those, those districts. Um, and brings to the point of foreign policy. Senate, Senate does have major, you know, they they're the ones that do the treaties, and, mm -hmm. and so, so that that is a, a concern that may be coming and developing. I know you're totally into right now campaigning, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's an important aspect. The, the the there has to be an the other side, which I know you're doing, and you you're stepping up. What what? You're 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 Columbus girl, so I wanted to ask you about what what's the Columbus decision or settlement with the uh, 32 people? You know that that was sort of an interesting uh, settlement that just happened. What about the uh, action uh, plan that just came through with Columbus? Those are some good models that you could build a campaign on, is saying this is something on the ground, boom forward. Um, what are you are you? I know you're getting subsumed into going to. Where are you hearing out out in the the hinterlands? You know, Columbus. You're, you're mm -hmm. used to working in politics at Columbus. Now you're getting out into Lima. You know, and, and other places. Mm -hmm. that, you know, wherever you lost your tire. Where was that? That was like in the middle of nowhere, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, but well, yeah, nowhere. I'm not going to label any place of nowhere, but um, <laughs> no. I mean, I. Middle of I, Ohio. I, okay. <laughs> I think one of the, so yeah, the, the things you referenced, I mean, yeah, that settlement, that settlement was a good development and just having accountability for what our expectations are from law enforcement officers. So, you know, view can that you, as, as a- Can you briefly describe it? Cause I think we have folks that aren't from Columbus and, and, and from- So your... there was a, yeah, there was a lawsuit brought against the, the city and based on the behavior of police officers during the protests last summer and folks that were involved in the protests getting uh, attacked you know, and, and having a lot of injuries from some of the interactions with law enforcement during the protests. And lawsuit was successfully won and, and then a settlement that's gonna be delivered to the victims of that behavior. Um, so that, you know, I think that what, what unites us is a need for accountability or what I'm finding and talking to people. And we know the police issue is a really uh, dicey one in politics right now. And a lot of discussion at the national level among you know the party, Democratic Party and all this about how we should be talking about police. But, you know, I find that once you focus on, hey, we have some behavior that doesn't line up with our values and there needs to be accountability when that type of behavior happens, regardless of who is doing it, then you can bring a lot of folks into that conversation and agree on that. And I think this is, this is one example of that, you know, having pellets that are hitting people and having lasting damage in that way doesn't, um, doesn't line up with what we expect. So anyway, that, that was, that's the settlement that just happened. And then, you know, the climate action plan, positive development that, you know, we're seeing the emissions goal increase from what was initially proposed um, or the reduction in emissions goal was, was increased from what was initially proposed by the city. And that was due to a lot of coalition building activism from many organizations. Um, and, you know, the organization that I co-founded Columbus Stand Up was part of, you know, some of those discussions early on. So that was great, great to see. And um, I don't know if other folks have 
have thoughts on that that are more deeply involved in it on the call. I saw Kathy, I think, on earlier, but um, to me, that was just a show of what's possible when we are organized and and really, you know, fighting back against what is sometimes a more uh, how should I say, modest in expectations of policymaking from the city government. So that was a good, that was a good win. And then generally, I mean, one of the things that's positive in campaigning is a lot of the issues that are getting brought up, even in places that are, you know, smaller, more rural, whatever, than Columbus, they connect. And a lot of concern about opioid fentanyl epidemic, that continues to be a big issue. And that's hitting both cities and rural areas very hard and making sure that we're getting support for that. Mental health care. I mean, I had someone suggest that you know, almost the whole state feels like it's in a mental health crisis. A lot of you know, people after the pandemic, but just through the struggle of what it is to be able to be economically stable in our state, um, making sure that we have regular access to healthcare. I think there's a big opportunity on a lot of these issues to bring many different types of people into the fold. And, and that's been one of the things that's most exciting about the campaign so far. So January 22nd and January 23rd look like there are going to be some big days of actions. Uh, you've been very very to the point on uh, your candidacy will support right to choose um, the right to abortion. Um, January 23rd, they're talking about developing some kind of action. Details are not there yet, but January 22nd will be the anniversary of, uh, it, it's a whole different subject, but the nuclear war, uh, nuclear weapons being made illegal. So that I don't know how those I mean, people, women's right to human uh, human health. <laughs> I mean, that, that that's something that's that's a major discussion going on in the Supreme Court across the con across the world, across the country as well. The Senate will be playing into that somehow um, in the future. So, I I know you, you you've spoken very well on the. Uh, choice and abortion issue it, it, that that's very clear in your candidacy the um as i think david was sort of pushing you for uh developing an international uh, agenda as well of what where is the senate mm -hmm. when morgan harper is president of the senate when, <laughs> or <laughs> <laughs> where 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 are we heading you know that kind of thing or yeah. just a member of the senate well, you know yeah I mean, yeah, to me, it's like human rights has to be our first priority. And I think that we're going to have increasingly a very high degree of scrutiny expected in just what does our international intervention look like? What are we what are we putting money towards in other places? And is that aligning with our values? And I do think the value that you can get a lot of people to agree on is respecting human rights. And I do think that we spend way too much money on our military budget and it is not paying off in any way that appears to be benefiting a lot of the places where we have that activity or or and it's also at the detriment of a lot of need for investment domestically and and you know and I especially talking to a lot of younger people that is one of the biggest concerns that they have and not wanting to just be involved in places um, because we have some expectation of what military intervention will do but really just across the board what are we putting our money towards is it reflective of our values we all we should all agree that valuing human rights is something that we stand for as Americans and if it isn't then we need to be revisiting whether or not that investment should be happening. That that's about you know the level of discussion I would say I'm having during the campaign. But you know just for folks on the call to know, I mean my bias is and my whole focus is really on making sure that we're protecting human rights in the U.S. but then also of people abroad. And we have a lot of work to do to get to the place where we should be speaking about what other countries are doing, given the level of chaos that we've allowed to flourish among a lot of parts of our population and the amount of stress and the lack of resources that we've provided for people to be okay. Uh, so that's, David's, that's David's my perspective. Biting. David's biting at the bit. So go ahead. Oh, okay. well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm applauding silently. I, yeah. I, yeah, if there were, if there were two sentences of the last 10 sentences, 
on that issues page of your website, I know I know a significant degree of support that would be forthcoming out there. Um, I mean, there I, I don't know how much you hear about foreign policy from voters, uh, but I know that there are a lot of them uh, who care about it. And and I know that when people find out that the military budget is actually dramatically bigger than the infrastructure bill and the building back better bill put together, uh, it, first it shocks them and then they want to do something about it, you know? And, right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so it's even a lot of people who have been in the military, I find, you know, talking to people in Ohio, I mean, sometimes this is presented as uh, trying to be some way critical of those who are in the military, but not at all. I've, a lot of people who have been through that experience recognize that this isn't always the best investment and we need to be thinking differently about what our international um, activity looks like. So, yeah, no, so just for folks awareness, I mean, we, uh, we have gotten a lot of input over the course of the first couple months of the campaign. We're going to be doing a refresh of the site and, um, and yeah, David totally heard on that front of trying to incorporate this into the refresh version. Sandy, Sandy had a question too. Sandy, are you still available? Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. This may seem a little bit more pedantic after everything has been said, but um, but originally we were talking about what can we do about it, and I just have a question for you, um, Morgan. I'm interested in um, when you're going around the state if you're finding people who are willing to run or seem interested in running um, in you know in the districts when we figure out what those are, and um, but all this is to do with you know the N the NRA built a really had a really effective tactic where they would, um, you know, double down on dismissing people who were attacking people who were um, not seeing things their way. And we have really popular issues um, on, on this call. And um, is there a way, I mean, is, I mean, could we do this here too? Look at a few um, politicians in this state um, who run in the uh, in Congress or who are in Congress and who are in the state itself, and and say, hey, this is this is the voting record of this person um, for gerrymandering, um, for all this money in you know for extending the military budget as opposed to um, money for health care and for drug uh, issues. So that's is there a way we can target? I've been milling around with this idea for a while, and I'm just wondering if there is this anything people think might be helpful? So I just want to make sure I understand the question. So you're saying, is there a way to be more uh, targeted and attacks of existing elected officials whose opinions or positions we might not agree with through campaigns? Is that correct? Just like even as a chart, that? hey, this is this is what this person, this candidate that you is on their your ballot. This is the kind of things this person is all for. They're for pollution. They're for military, a big expansive military budget. They're for gerrymandering. They vote on all these things. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it it sounds uh, it sounds novel because we don't end up spending a lot of time talking about you know specific policy positions that people have had. It's the game of politics that just gets at this very high level that isn't really that substantive. But I, I, do, I do believe in the electorate that when you come with substance and you come with critique about you know, what people are doing that hasn't aligned with what we're expecting from our elected officials, you can break through in that way. I mean, that's one of the, I suppose, the underpinnings of my very young and <laughs> uh, new political career is be honest with people and you know especially but but we also need to be honest about some things within people in our own party perhaps you know that are not also aligned with our values so i think there is the possibility of doing that but we have a lot of people who try to build off a strategy of hiding in a corner and then waiting for paid ads to convince people that they're the one based on a a nice smile and a good you know a good throw of a football and our whole message is look where that's gotten us. Chaos, right? Absolute chaos. And so the only way that we're going to be able to have a shot of getting government on the side of doing anything for us is by having somebody who's about to be very aggressive and ready to rumble to tell the people the truth and motivate people to turn out to vote. The good news on that front is I think that's probably the only way, getting back to the original point, one of the things that David was referencing, of, of getting through to people to make them care 
to make them at all think that a vote is worth it. So um, can, can we guarantee success on any of these things? No, we have an uphill battle here in Ohio to get people who believe in democracy, believe in government doing good things, getting elected at this point. But it is our, I believe it's our only shot of, of having, having an ability to try to win. Yeah, um, thanks Morgan. I know you're bouncing around for all kinds of events, always doing some kind of campaigning. So thank you. Uh, making it to the salon and you please come back anytime and every time you you can make it um we'd like to keep up with your campaign as it develops uh for uh, throughout hopefully through november 2022 uh, 20, you know yeah uh the 2022 it's uh, we're not even looking <laughs> yeah at, for sure i want to get primary. through the primary we're not even looking at the primary we we, we know you <laughs> for made sure it the primary we we know that no i mean no there's some some <laughs> serious work you have to do again. No, we have a lot of work to do to make it through the primary i know that. <laughs> i know i know no and know. i'll just say no i appreciate it mark but let people know like we so we have a campaign manager that started this week we have an organizing director who was on beto's campaign and for senate 2018 considered gold standard field operation who's on his way moving to Ohio right now to be part of the campaign. So we're feeling really good. Want everyone involved. Email me, Morgan at morganharper.org okay. with ideas. And, and let's keep let's keep working organize. together. And let's organize. organize. Yeah. Organize. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, and then my favorite question I saw just pops up in the chat. Unfortunately, we need we need resources to support the campaign. So uh We'll drop the, Mark, I'll share the email with you, or the, sorry, the, the mailing address with you if anyone wants to support via hard check. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Morgan. And, Great. Uh, you be safe Thanks so much. There. Be safe out there and always have a spare tire, okay? Perfect, I appreciate it. Good. <laughs> pro tip, campaign pro tip. Yeah. All right. But yeah, if people go to morganharper.org, also any information about uh, supporting is on there as well, on the website. Thank you. Great. All right, thanks so much. Yeah. Bye. Good night. So, David, so thank you for that interjection. You, you had asked, is there anybody out there? To, I mean, she's there. I mean, uh, yeah, we're ready to mold, uh, but we do have to get her past Tim, uh, what's his name, Ryan. Uh, Tim Ryan is running, and he's, he's, for Ohio, everybody, I mean, this is first time in a while that we've had an open seat for a U.S. Senator in Ohio. So it, it, it's sort of fun to sort of vision. <laughs> um, Michael, you've been jumping on that chat. I don't know if uh, you want to talk a little bit or not, but because she's talking about the military and, and some other. Uh, nope, just commenting in the chat, just trying to stay connected. You are, you are always, yes. So th David, I'm here. Plan this plan. Plan this. Uh, this date, whatever it is, 2022, uh, December. Uh, I got to get on my calendar. 11. Is it? Will it be the 11th? Not for 2022. I'm sorry. Will what be the 11th? Will uh. Your, your commitment to come to the salon next year. <laughs> I, I will be I, it on your calendar. I have yeah. December 11th next year open. I also have December 10th and 12th and every other day open. So very good, very good. Yeah. So it, whatever date that is, that it's usually the second Saturday of of the month. Um, oh, second Saturday. Okay, let me see. But it's uh, anybody, so yeah, you know, it's, the folks that can't called in from uh, no, California. It will be the tenth. Do you guys then, have we... particular uh, regional questions of David, or just your 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 uh, <laughs> they call uh, groupies that like follow on David? I mean, no, I'm, I'm teasing. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, Derek, go uh, Derek, go ahead, please. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, David. I just want to say it's so good to see you, and I so appreciate. Uh, the work you do. I'm a member of Beyond War. I'm also the head of the Democratic Party in La Jolla, La Jolla California, and my wife and I run the Climate Mobilization Coalition, which is a chapter of the New York uh, Climate Mobilization. When people say, what can you do? I would say a big thing is read your book, Curing Exceptionalism. People, to have you say what you say in that book, it, there's so few people that have the courage to say those things. And uh, every time I tell people the, the facts and figures in that book, they, they stop and uh, 
change course because it's time for us to, you know, we've all been drinking this Kool-Aid for so long about the American democracy and the greatness of America and all this mm. stuff. And that you bring it up and put it in writing is, is really impactful. One thing though, you do say you wanna bring power down from the federal government to the states more. And I wanna, I wanna challenge that because I know this, the feds are, they're really frustrating. Blind. They're really frustrating, but the states of this country to have everything run by the states is, uh, I just can't, I can't deal with it. And some of my friends, you know, they get really ridiculous about this. They say, well, the only thing real is city <sighs> politics. They want to have everything be run by the cities and then the counties. And, um, and, you know, they can't look beyond any further than a city or county. And then I tease them and say, well, I understand local is where it's at. I'm organizing my neighborhood. I'm going to have a climate action plan in my neighborhood. And we're going to, we're going to hope that the neighborhood climate action plan spreads to the city and then the county and then the state and then the feds and then the world. We have to have an end to fossil fuels in the whole world. And we have to have the federal government begin the end of fossil fuels and then set that example for the world. Because our last guy, you know, the marmalade head, he said it was a hoax, climate change. And now uh, at least we have a president that has two envoys. He has a national, I mean, an international climate envoy and a local climate person. So that's some progress, but I just, I just hope you, I don't know, I, I'm really surprised that you back off of the federal government. Huh. Okay, well, I, I first of oh, all- Oh, uh, David, David, just saying for two seconds, Nancy is another one that said that uh, you, you wanted people to, who would, who would run, she tried, she ran uh, okay. as, as someone as well. She was a candidate as well. So go ahead, I'm sorry. Just to include Nancy in that question, Thank you, she, Mark. Thank her you. campaign, her campaign was probably what uh, inspired this question. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, it is true. We ran against an incumbent Democrat. We spent nine thousand dollars and we got thirty-seven thousand votes. So there is a lot of support for progressive politics for the Green New Deal and the Green New Deal. Absolutely, there is. And I'm very glad to hear that. And I will try to speak to both Derek and Nancy. Uh, and you, then you can tell me where I misunderstood and got everything completely wrong. Uh, but if this video ever ends up on YouTube, I'm going to steal that first uh, 30 seconds of the question uh, and put it on the on the website for my book, Curing Exceptionalism. Uh, and you, I'll talk to you about the commission you can expect. But um, I, I, I think like the gold standard, like the very best comments you get out of U.S. politicians are actually right along the lines of what of what you just said. Uh, you know, the United States should completely reverse its policies on climate and then set that example for the rest of the world, which is just insane arrogance. The United States should begin moving up from last place catching up to and learning from other parts of the world. This is the incomprehensible bit in U.S. politics. You, as, as George H.W. Uh, Bush, I would never apologize for the United States. Even more of a taboo for any of them in any party. I would never suggest that the United States learn from some other country. So when this was a weird thing about the Bernie Sanders campaign, which for all the good and bad in it, this was one of the super good that was he talked about all the examples where all the other wealthy countries of the world or many of them or a few of them have shown the way where, you know, we don't have to keep, you know, doing studies about whether single payer health care might work in theory and just diligently ignoring the fact that it's working in in practice for much of humanity you know and, and so i actually would like to see the us government climb out of last place 
on climate destruction. Uh, I, I know you can measure it in various ways, and China is you know first place in various ways. But uh, but I, I you know the, the the notion of the United States leading the world, I think, is part of the problem, and it and it pisses off much of the world. It's it's just sounds so arrogant. A lot of the world would like the United States to just learn a little bit from what they're trying to do and climb out of the very bottom. Um, now, this question of, uh, you know, should power go to the states or the federal government or to international bodies? Um, the reason that I think and hopefully wrote that we should have more power both at lower levels than the national government in the United States and at higher levels, that is international bodies that are empowered and democratized and used uh, is just simply the dumb reason that the US federal government is so incredibly corrupt. Um, and and it, it just takes vastly less money to, to uh, run things in a, in a state, uh, but if, you were to have more power and more policy decisions being made in 50 states and thousands of localities, uh, I, I think it would be harder for the, the big national and global corporations to buy off all of those different areas. Uh, and it would be easier for the people of a state or a locality to, to reform the politics, to create public financing to create uh, fair media coverage and said to have uh, more legitimate uh, elections than what you have at the national level. Uh, I, I understand totally that if you just moved everything from the federal level to all the 50 states today, uh, a lot of the states would make things even worse. And some of the states would make things dramatically better. And it would be, you know, there would be mass migration from the horrible states to the good states and vice versa, and it would be chaos. Uh, but you know, when, when you go to a smaller country and you see what the smaller geography and the smaller numbers of people and the smaller dollar figures allow people to do to put public pressure on their national government, the United States just looks too big. You know, we have no control over that monster. Yeah. Well, you know, you David, know. So, so it's David, just hang on, Derek. So David, the, uh, the new Green Deal or the do, new, do, Green Deal new, um, is it possible in the present politics that we're talking? You, you you laid out a very lamented list earlier. It was a lot of I I I, I, I hear I'm Christian, so I hear lamentation in your voice when you're you're like going from much of that which what's happened right are we where, where's the power where where do i mean nancy ran on green new deal um i think it's possible uh, I, I mean obviously anything is possible there's no basis for saying something is impossible um but uh i i think we're going to advance pieces of a green new deal locally and at the state level and in other countries that can influence this particular country sooner than we're going to do it in the through the US Congress. I mean that's just and I I agree because I you know going internationally I've seen you know uh, <laughs> any country you want to mention better transportation than the United States. And so that exceptionalism that uh, Derek was trying to talk about is you know what you've written about is that mythology of of white settlerism, the frontierism, manifest death, uh, 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 Monroe Doctrine. That those historical have really messed with our brain, as you mentioned. We we've been really been like twilt, tilted and quitted. Uh, what is possible? <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm at the I'm at the I'm already past halftime. I've already seen the marching band. I'm ready to move on. What I mean, I'm ready to really show my last active years of producing something, right? We we've been part of some stuff, and there's here now 
socially, I'd like to see policy put in place. I'd like to see uh, guarantees. Yeah, yeah. There's there is that explosion that you know racial justice is out of hand. There's global justice is wrong. Uh, we're going to hand and uh, you know and 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 I can't cuss in that kind of basket. You know that kind of stuff. So. I think Derek's raising his hand. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, yeah, Derek, I just, come on. I just, I just wanted to say a few more and things and about the federal, the federal government. You know, I think, David, it's a very big Republican talking point that the federal government needs to be really uh, disregarded. Yeah, disregarded. And, and two things that the, that the big corporations really don't like is the federal government because they can pass res, res, regulations against them and labor. So the federal, the corporations over the last so many years, ever since the green of the uh, Roosevelt time, they pretty well destroyed uh, labor unions. They were labor unions used to do great stuff in this country. Now they're down to about I don't know twenty percent of the private workforce. And uh, we, still, we are still the reason why prevailing wages are are uh, so. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, but. <laughs> Then the other thing, the great things that have been done by the federal government, the national highway system, defense highway system, women getting the right to vote, uh, the Supreme Court, which is at the national level, doing Roe v. We, v. Wade. Um, you know, there, uh, there's been a lot of stuff done. Uh, the right to work, uh, you know, I mean, no, not the right to work, the, uh, uh, the eight hour day and um, unemployment insurance and uh, Social Security and Medicare and all these things. We, what you said about public elections, we need public financing of elections. And if we got public financing of elections, which we have in a few states right now, we could make this federal government something that serves the people because we really have to, I'm here in California, which is considered the most progressive state, well, maybe New York, uh, progressive state most progressive uh, nation i think isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah and california is a long way from where we need to be yeah. it's really yeah, corrupt jamie, jamie wants to get in he's like having a heart attack over here I okay think. no i'm i'm okay but uh let's see <laughs> i guess there's two things that i want to uh mention first of all I, did you listen to elon musk and what's your reaction to all that he said and his refreshing honesty. And the other thing is, I believe the 800 pound gorilla that we're all ignoring so far is that the decline of America that I don't even know if it's fully begun, but it started with the overturning of McCain Feingold and, you know, and uh, the decision of Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court ruling of Citizens United and don't you real don't you think that there's uh you know the reason for the insanity that is our our government which is completely disconnected from the pe what the people want is is you know just obvious yeah yeah that's been a, a repeated uh occurrence in the chat is that corporate control over everything limits anything that would be good <laughs> can I can I reply, Mark, to that? Go ahead, David, please. Yeah, obviously, I couldn't agree more that uh, campaign financing is a problem. And uh, what's what, what we call in other countries corruption and call campaign donations in this country is, is the same thing. And it is corruption and it is a problem. Um, um, but I, I think we should remember that, you know, women got the right to vote in states and the state's pressure led to the federal government, that people got the eight hour day in various cities and states and it built up to the federal level, that the federal government is literally preventing states from having single payer health coverage, uh, even indirectly in, in California, where every time there's a Republican governor, the Democratic uh, legislature passes single payer health care. And every time there's a Democratic governor, they don't because the Democrats in Washington tell them not to. Um, you know, I, I I don't know what the particular Elon Musk wisdom is that we're supposed to be aware of today. I don't actually did, follow yeah, the guy. Yeah, yeah, did he say something? I don't know. You say, do you know about Elon? I, I, I'm not on his wavelength, I, I, I guess. I'm not in his. Oh, he was refreshingly uh, 
saying he didn't want any government handouts. He didn't want you know any subsidies for for all the you know all the new technology that he's saying. He said we can handle it, you know, and he was saying. Uh, yeah, don't pass it. the the build back yeah. better thing you He's know they handle on it by taking over a <laughs> section of texas that's going to be the spacex whatever uh, uh uh launch zone he's like taking it's like right at the border of mexico and texas and it's this region that's like in a beautiful area but he's like taking it over it, it's becoming privatized people this are this is a guy who publicly supports a coup in Venezuela for the purpose of getting materials to build his machines with. This is a guy who could end starvation on earth with what would be a rounding error in his pile of loot. Uh, this is not where I look for moral guidance, you know? So yeah, so uh, why did you bring that in? I, I don't know, why Why did you bring that discussion in to- Well, I, and the point about he could end, end hunger you know, he directly addressed that issue by saying if, if they could give him a good reason and a good argument for how he could do a significant amount of good to end hunger in Afghanistan, he would give them six billion dollars. And I haven't heard, you know, but he asked them, the the people in charge there to, to give him a good reason, you know, and that's the, you know, the, the tr reality might be that you, you no matter how much you give, it's going to just go to the, you know, it's just going to go to the dictators and the chair, the CEOs of these charities. You, you know ahead. what would help Congress do a much better job than the horrendous job it does on such things would be having it out from under the thumb of billionaires. And you know what would do that? Not waiting for him to decide to donate his money, taxing the damn money and taking it away from him and ceasing the existence of billionaires for god's sake well he's already said that he he, he has like a 54 percent uh tax rate he, he he actually had to sell some of his stock like 10 billion dollars worth just for to pay his taxes so nobody's Steven, taxing his so wealth Steven nobody's says, oh so yeah Steven's his taxes his wealth that, is very tax 99 percent would that be an okay rate? Ninety nine percent tax of ninety nine percent. Would you would you support that? Stephen, well, I please. I think uh, thirty five. The current thirty five percent is, is no. I think that's that's that's, that's, that's planning. That's it was ninety one under Eisenhower on the yeah. top. But the, the the problem. Oh, the and the problem. He, he made this point that you know even if you were to take all the money of all the billionaires, it still would not put a dent in our deficit. And the you know the Congress can spend it That's faster than anybody can make it, and it could yeah. save millions of lives, and it could save the possibility of ecosystems continuing to exist on this planet, and it would accomplish first and foremost getting rid of billionaires. We but, I we're mean, expected it, to live on one percent. That's not we still, we'll still we'll have okay. like humongous so, deficits so, so in the trillions. Change. Right. Our deficit is like three trillion a year. Yes, well, you got one and a quarter trillion every year on wars I have no use for. You got another half a trillion on horrendous other stuff I have no use for. And you got trillions sitting in the pockets of billionaires. Uh, and there, there's absolutely no reason not to take that money and put it to good use. Except that the, the government is so corrupt it's yeah. pointless and bezos yeah. is the same way Who is it corrupted it's by money. it's corrupted by the so, people sitting so on the piles of money guess what today is december 11th right they're the only ones that aren't the government officials are the ones that are corrupted because of citizens united because they are begging you know anybody for money every day you know right after they get off work they go across the street right on 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 60 minutes they talked about dialing for dollars yeah, but not me because I don't have any. Who are they getting the vast bulk of the money from? A very Corporations, small segment sure. of They're the population. It from the oligarchs. It's like an oligarchy. Oligarch. There's about a hundred of them that run the whole country. That's basically the deal. Okay, so we want to get Pat on to redirect some of the. Yeah, stuff. really. That's great. Thank you, uh, thank you, David. Some, it's been great talking to you. Some of, some of that conversation is is uh, beyond what we can deal with in a salon. 
I mean, it really is. Uh, oh yeah, now, of course. Yeah, it's That's great to open thing. it up. It's great to open it up, but then there needs to be a, a, a some some other venue. So Pat, go ahead, talk, please. And she, I don't know, David, if you know Pat Marida, but Marida, Miss Marida, is is a, a a folk hero. She has been so active and, and has been kept. Okay. Talk about accountability and all the other stuff, please. Uh, and hopefully she'll help me join and, and January 22nd. Will we, will we, is that a date for us to do a, a, a state, a, a public action around the uh, abolition of nukes? Well, I certainly have thought about that. So let's talk about that. Uh, that's okay. a, yeah. A, 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 yeah, so I have, well, because of my age, I guess I have more history than some of the other people. I have, well, I'll attribute that, that to my age. Um, I just wanted to say about, you know, about the corporate tax, it used to be 90% above a certain amount. I forget what that amount was, but that, uh, that kept uh, the billionaires, once they had to pay 90% or they had to pay most of their income, on, they, didn't, they didn't really have much ambition. Uh, to, to, there wasn't a lot of point in them raising, earning that much more money. So the greed kind of stopped at, at that point. So that was what I was going to say and, um, on that subject. And then I put, I put some notes, some things in the uh, chat about the subsidies in the, for solutions that aren't really climate solutions in the Build Back Better Act. They're false climate solutions. And uh, there's been a number of statements going around, uh, sign on letters for groups uh, uh, saying, take these things out of the Build Back Better Act. And there is on December 15th, I think it's at 11 a.m. I put it in the chat. Uh, <clears throat> Ron Wyden, the senator from Senator from Oregon, and he is the uh, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee. He's going to be talking about the Build Back Better Act, and there's a chance to get on there. And when you register, you can ask a question, and you can say you can ask him if he's going to take some of these false climate solutions, including especially nuclear power. And also, of course, there are subsidies for oil and gas in there, too. So if, ask if he's going to take those out. So that's that's one event that's happening. And, and then at some point, I might, I probably will, I'll try to write an article for the Free Press about uh, op opposing uh, Ohio House Bill 434, which is a nuclear subsidy, a whole new, brand new uh I don't know whether you want me to take time to talk about that at this point, but I could if, if there's yeah, but time. I do want to put a little advertisement. So since Pat, you did mention, we do encourage people to write for the free press, okay? So please, if you can put pen to paper, you don't even need to do computer, we can convert it if you need to. Put some thought on paper and send it our way, please. All right, uh, uh, David, do you have a, 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 or Pat wanted to put a, a, a further definition of what she had said, and then David maybe, or but David, I don't know how much longer you have for us. Uh, what's so? Because we're sort of into the uh, discussion mode right now, the salon, the true salon. We're not presentation anymore; it's conversation. Um, but. With well, you I can, on, I can say with thank you. you on, <laughs> no, no, no. With you on, it, it gives us an opportunity to talk to people that are not within our little framework. I mean, we 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 have 270 as our thought, right? And you probably have what's what 495? Is that what it is? Are you within 495 or outside of that? I don't know. The Beltway you're talking about? Yeah, the Beltway. I'm talking about. <laughs> You're just outside of it, I think. Oh, I'm 100 miles outside of it, but when you're three states it's away, it seems like it's I'm just outside. I know. Even the mountains. Yeah, my brother, my brother just moved to Virginia. He's in Richmond now, so. Yeah, that's that's straight east of here, but also straight south of. A long east. ways from there, yeah, a long ways from there. So, Pat, please uh, continue, please, and then uh, D David, I just if you need to go. Please just sign off and and but please stay with us if you can. 
Well, if you, if you don't need me for anything in particular, I got a lot of things to get onto, but uh, I really appreciate you. So, Pat, did you have a d direct response to him or do you thank want you to just so update? Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank well, you, David. I have a short statement about Ohio House Bill 434. I could just, uh, I could put something in the chat or I could just go over it now, but I also plan to write an article. So um, whatever there's time for. Right. No, yeah. you, you do your time. I just wanted to say goodbye to David if he didn't, if he, if he needs to get on to some things. But Derek, Nancy, thank you for coming out. And uh, Sheila Goldner, I, I see you from Cali as well, but you haven't said much. So, but thank you for coming out. And they came for you, David. David, and so just so that you guys know, next year, the second Saturday of December, David Swanson is going to be here giving us a great evaluation of 2022, and we've achieved peace, some sort of peace. Maybe we've uh, 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 elected some kind of Congress and Senate that projects peace. I don't know what that means in the United States. I know David has no hope in the world. He's, he's not a hopey in him. So I understand that, but uh, I, I still, I, I, I've been raised up Presbyterian, so I hope there is some kind of something going on, that there's some kind of progress of something. That's all I'm saying. So thank you again for okay. extending your, and, and uh, Suzanne, uh, stay in touch with David and keep, keep your 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 articles are getting posted on our our uh, website so please everybody read david swanson stuff and his podcast that's on wgrn not podcast well it's a radio thing right it's a radio show basically. yeah and a podcast sure yeah it's a podcast I, I, everybody's in these new technologies I, I don't know what the right term is but it's on the radio wgrn locally here and uh brian just mentioning Pat, hang on. I'm not forgotten you. <laughs> Brian, Brian, say, thanks, David. Brian is uh, always wanting to update us on WGRN as well. So don't forget. Uh, no, nothing uh, about WGRN. I know nothing, nothing. Oh, I mean, WCRS, my bad. Yes, I know. This can be so you update us a second, but let Pat, let Pat finish what she was going to do. I just wanted to get David off because David was wanting to move on and it was great. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to mention Ohio House Bill 434. Yes, uh, yes. It's before it's in the uh, in the Ohio House Energy and Natural Resources Committee being heard. Mm -hmm. uh, they will. Uh, they've heard proponent testimony and sponsor testimony. It's all sponsored by a, uh, about 15 Republicans. Uh, it's called the, To Enact the Advanced Nuclear Technology Helping Energize Mankind, or, or ANTHEM yeah. Act. Uh, it would establish what they call the Ohio Nuclear Development Authority. And this proposed authority, it would authorize spending for research and development of new nuclear reactors. And it's all tied to thorium and molten salt reactors that are being promoted by a small company called E-Generation up in Cleveland. Hmm. Uh, there's been, there is really no financial analysis uh, by the state of, for this. Uh, there's nothing, they can raise money, but there's nothing that limits their spending. And that's the, they, I don't know exactly how they can, how they're going to dip into the public till, but there is nothing that limits the spending of this authority. Uh, they include taking nuclear waste uh, from Davis, Bessie and Perry, that's unprecedented. And they wanna reprocess it, which means they wanna take some, uh, uh, turn it into liquid, what's turned into liquid, this is high level radioactive waste and extract some things out of it. So they wanna do this reprocessing, which has been, disastrous wherever it's occurred in the world. Uh, and they also have eminent domain. And so Ohio would be responsible for, for all costs associated with this authority and with the Nuclear Development Authority. And that would include uh, the decommissioning, cleaning up and dismantling of anything that would be built. 
and any damages resulting from spills or accidents, all that would be, um, you know, the Ohio would be responsible for that. So it could bankrupt Ohio. So that's just a little overview of this bill. Uh, this is the third legislature that it's been in. It's been around for a while. It passed the House last uh, in, 20, in 2020. Uh, after it passed, it, it came out of the committee and, uh, and it was a full year later that the House voted on it. <laughs> so it, it's that kind was, of... Um, that, was in the middle of that was in the middle of the COVID stuff too. So that, that was amazing that it got passed. It really is that... Well,